Thank you very much for the round of floor speeches. Now we will return to the paper speakers. The next speaker for the proposition is Matt Kennard. He is a co-founder and head of investigations at Declassified UK, a news outlet investigating British foreign policy. He was a fellow and then director at the Centre for Investigative Journalism in London and has worked as a staff writer for the Financial Times internationally. You have the ears of the house. Um, thanks a lot. It's good to be here. I mean, I should preface what I'm going to say by um, just saying my position, which is that Britain is not a democracy. It's an oligarchy uh, and has been forever. Uh, we have a British establishment which has been in place for a thousand years. They've, been, they've had to make various concessions to the people, but effectively they still have power in our country. And they do that through the two-party system. The two-party system is an outgrowth of oligarchy because if you're an oligarch or part of an establishment and you want to maintain control of the political system but give the illusion that people have choice, the two-party system is perfect for you because you can make both parties work for you, which is what has happened in this country with the Tories and Labour. Um, but I want, to look, I want to qualify what I'm saying with a specific case, uh, which is something that should be on all our minds now because... We are witnessing the worst uh, 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 human rights crisis in our lifetimes in Gaza right now with the Israeli genocide. And we've done a lot of work at Declassified on this. And the UK government is not, a, um, not complicit, which is what some people say. We are participants in it. And I'll talk about that later. But our government is also cracking down on journalists who in this country are revealing what the Israelis are doing and revealing what the Israelis are doing in this country. Just last week, Asa Wynn Stanley, who's a reporter for the website Electronic Intifada, had his house raided at 5 in the morning by 13 police officers, um, uh, and they took all his uh, electronic devices um, and didn't charge him with a crime. Now, that sounds like something out of a dictatorship, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like something out of a democracy. The month before, Sarah Wilkinson, another independent journalist. Yeah. Go on. Just about the British piece of the Israeli piece, because you just said it was the Israelis that they're arrested No, I, I didn't say that. I said the British piece. Yeah, you said the Israelis. I didn't. Well, if it was, it was a mistake, but I don't think I did. Anyway, the British police arrested him. The, the Israeli police can't arrest people in this country. Yeah, well... Anyway... Okay, so the British police arrested uh, Asa Wins, oh, they and they didn't arrest him as well, so you got that wrong. They, didn't, they charged him. That, the whole point is they didn't arrest him. So in this country, the police can come in and take all your devices uh, without even charging you. Interestingly, go on. Do you really believe that his, uh, I mean, arrest aside, do you really believe the idea that Israel brought down Jeremy Corbyn, which is that this journalist's central contention, is not anti-Semitic? Uh, no, I believe there was a confluence of different... Fact, uh, elements within the British establishment that brought down Jeremy Corbyn, including the Israel lobby um, and including arms companies, including the Labour Party itself. Uh, it was a confluence of different factors. And he was an interesting case, actually, we should talk about Jeremy Corbyn, because the oligarchical system I'm describing was working fine up to when he was elected um, leader of the Labour Party. And in 2015, he overwhelmingly won it. The Labour Party swelled to the biggest uh, party in Western Europe. And key to his downfall was the Labour Party itself, which showed what the two-party system is for. The Labour Party gives the illusion that they have an adversarial relationship with the Tories, they duke it out based on principled lines. But the key... Huh? But the key to his downfall was that he lost the presidential election in that No, that's what I'm saying. He, 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 got, the biggest swing to, he got the biggest swing to Labour since 1945 and 2017 within a couple of thousand votes of becoming Prime Minister and if he hadn't been fighting a guerrilla warfare campaign or they hadn't been fighting a guerrilla war against him, his own party, for two years, he would have won that election and he wouldn't have had the horrors of Boris Johnson. But anyway, for me it was very revealing of how the oligarchical system works because it was key. the Labour Party's role in, in the British society is to absorb and neutralise the left and, it, and, and systems you don't really understand them when they're running as they should. When they stopped running as they should, like when Corbyn was elected, you, they had to come out of the shadows. You saw the different pressure points of our democracy and you saw the Labour Party actively, and this is in the papers, you can read it, Pe uh, senior people in the, in the Labour Party were actively working to stop him becoming Prime Minister in 2017. But anyway, that's a, that, that's a different story. On the Gaza genocide, and we've done a lot of work at Declassified, Asa has done a lot, a lot of work, and I was just mentioning the other journalist, Sarah Wilkinson, the month before, had her house raided 
by, uh, by police. They, they bundled her into a van, they tipped over the urn with her mum's ashes against the wall. She had to, take it, she had to scrape her mum's ashes off the wall. Richard Medhurst, the week before, another independent journalist, pro-Palestinian, was detained at Heathrow Airport for 23 hours in solitary confinement. Does any of that sound like a democracy? Interestingly, I don't think we have a free press in this, in this country either. We have a propaganda system because nothing I've just told you has ever appeared in the UK newspaper. Nothing I've told you. An another example of another journalist who was uh, persecuted by this country, Julian Assange, spent five years in maximum security prison for doing what journalists are meant to do, which is reveal the crimes of state. Just the other day, the Council of Europe, the highest human rights body in Europe, voted that he was held as a political prisoner in this country for five years. Not one single British newspaper has ever written a word about it. So what we have is a system which operates very nicely if you read the mainstream media, very nicely if you go to Cambridge University. If you actually start looking into the specifics of it, it's an illusion. And if you press the boundaries too hard, you'll find out that it doesn't exist. Uh, and in the case of the Gaza genocide, we've done a lot of work. This country is participating with two spy flights every day sent by the RAF from our base in Cyprus over Gaza, giving that information to the Israelis to carry out what is an annihilation campaign now in Jabalia camp in northern Gaza. You should, every, anyone who's not looking at what's happening in Gaza, you should, because these are crimes that were echoed down the ages. Um, no newspapers covered that. We covered it at the classified. The SAF... Go on. What is stopping anybody in this country from looking at any other newspaper? You can look up Al Jazeera, you can even look at Russia Today, or any other newspaper. Just saying that the British newspapers are not posting about it. Does it stop anybody here from looking at any other country's newspaper and reading that free? Of course it doesn't. I'm, I never said that. But what I'm saying is the ma they're, they're, not the mass, they're not mass media. The, the, back and forth. the important point is the mass media. If you look at what is read and what's watched, that has a very influential impact on society. That's where opinions are formed on a general scale. The BBC and others work effectively uh, a lot of the time as propaganda organ of the British government. Anyway, let me, let me, let me move on quickly because it's important to ask in a democracy, who's making the decisions, right? It should be politicians. I just want to bring up a case. Uh, in this country, there's, there's lobbying by corporations, by different, um, uh, uh, by different foreign countries. Israel has a very powerful lobby in this country. There was a di diary written by Alan Duncan, the former foreign minister from 2016 to 19. He was uh, a junior minister to Boris Johnson when Boris Johnson was foreign secretary. Boris Johnson wanted to appoint him Middle East Minister uh, in 2016. And uh, it was all fine. They sent, off, they sent off the request to Theresa May to OK it. And then Theresa May got a call from Conservative Friends of Israel. I think it was Stuart Polak or Eric Pickles. They said, you can't do that. This is all in the stories. You can read it. What did Theresa May? She's the most powerful person in the country, you think. She's democratically elected. She acceded to that demand. It goes back down to Boris Johnson and Alan Duncan, and they say, well, we can't do it because CFI don't want to do it. Um, and, and, and then they say, and Alan Duncan says, well, maybe I take on the Middle East brief, but I don't include Palestine, because that's what they were upset about, his position on Palestine, which is a moderate two-state solution, which is the official government policy. They go back to Theresa May, and they say no. So in, in, and then she, she says, you can't become Middle East minister. He becomes minister for Europe and the Americas. That is a foreign country or a, foreign, a lobby group for a foreign country overruling the democratically elected Prime Minister of Britain. Another point on C C Conservative Friends of Israel, they don't reveal their funders. You can guess who they are. What they do is they cultivate politicians young in their career and, and, and take them on propaganda tours of Israel. In fact, I was looking today and Andrew Bowie went on one. Six months, you, you joined Parliament when you were 30 years old and within six months you were in Israel paid for by Conservative Friends of Israel. Do you know who funds Conservative Friends of Israel? Is that a question? Yeah. Okay, well, he, they don't... Go on. Why is it only Israel? Why is it only Israel you ever talk about? Are there any other... Saudis. Uh, another one that often... Okay, another one that often... Another one... Another one that often takes... Another one that often takes politicians in Saudi Arabia, a brutal Wahhabi dictatorship, which is the British establishment is deeply invested in. BAE Systems sells billions of weapons to one of the most brutal dictatorships in the world. They do it a lot. Another lobby which is very interesting is uh, the American lobby. Mike Pompeo came in the summer of 2019, was recorded saying privately, we will do our, quote, level best to stop Jeremy Corbyn becoming Prime Minister of Britain. That would, that, that, oh, sorry. But 
I don't, but I, I don't, I think in a democracy, you should be working for the people you represent. You should not be paid to go by conservative friends of Israel who don't reveal their funders but are closely linked to the Israeli state. And actually, Andrew's trip was paid also by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, a couple of years later, Andrew didn't vote for a ceasefire in Gaza. He, did, he voted to, to, to make BDS illegal, which is another attack on democracy. Is he doing that for his constituents, or is he doing that because he was cultivated early on by a lobby group? I don't want any, lobby, I don't want any foreign states, any lobby groups that work for foreign states, paying for our politicians to go anywhere. We're a sovereign country. We shouldn't have that. That is a basic tenant. And in fact, I did interview Jeremy Corbyn recently, and he said, I've never taken money from a foreign country or foreign lobby group. So it's a... It's a it, I've got one minute So basically, I think that if you start picking away, we're, we're, we're indoctrinated from a young age in this country that we live in a democracy, we have a free press, and it's a very seductive uh, uh, story, and it's one that is used in soft power. But if you start picking away, you start pushing the boundaries, you end up like Asa Win Stanley. You get, he, he's a, a brilliant journalist, has done amazing work uh, on Israel in this country and, and also what's happening in Gaza. He got his house raided. That's what happens if you start pushing the boundaries of what we're told is democracy. Go on. But I don't. Well, I've, I've just. I've just. I'm here, but I, 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 there's, I've just listed a whole group of journalists that, aren't, that have been recently raided and arrested and put in prison, including Julian Assange, who spent five years inside Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison. So yes, I, I don't know if I should... I don't know, I don't know what you want me to be, if I, if I should be grateful that the British establishment allows us to have free speech. We won that. They didn't give it to us. They, would hate, they hate the fact... There's nothing more than the British establishment hate than democracy itself, because it, it, it impinges on their ability to operate and to, to project power internally and externally. So, yeah, I would say um, we need to, as, a, as, as young people, journalists, really expose the, the hidden pressure points of our democracy, or so-called democracy. We need, to ex we need to take seriously what we're told exists in this country and make sure that, that, that it's really there. Because if we don't test it and we don't use it, it will disappear, and it's disappearing rapidly right now.